Let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for this day in this season of Lent that we're here to um, think about and uh, pray about and reflect on. We thank you for the gift that you've given to us. We thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts, invisibly, and yet uh, truly and uh, powerfully. We ask you to continue to give us grace to be faithful to your own movements and working in our lives. We thank you for the gift of another year uh, at the university in our studies and to help us in our respective courses, help us in our families and our relationships so that we may give you glory in all that we do. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As, as it was, was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray for us. us. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the first talk of the of this uh, for this semester. And uh, today's talk will be on the season of Lent, since obviously we're in the season of Lent, and we'll have a chance to just reflect a bit about this, about some of its history, and particularly just the practical things of the season of Lent, what the Church does in order to help us focus on it, and in order to get the most out of it. Uh, if we finish this talk in the time allotted to us, and if someone could just let me know at about uh, 20 past uh, 12, please, uh, when, uh, when, uh, so we can have some time for questions, and then we'll move into the next talk, which will be the, the Easter Triduum. So Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter Sunday. I doubt we're going to finish all those three next uh, Friday, but anyway, I'll do my best, and then we'll have a talk for the Easter season, obviously when that season comes. So for the, uh, early, from the early church, the earliest days, the original Christian feast, uh, there are two major feasts in the calendar for today, uh, Christmas and Easter, but the early church, there was only one major feast, and that was the feast of Easter. The, the feast of Christmas only began to be celebrated several centuries into the actual um, life of the church. Why? Because the main message of the, of the early Christians was in fact to preach the, the Christ crucified and risen. You might recall when the apostles were looking for the replacement of Judas, and then Matthias eventually is elected, they, had, they set aside some criteria, and they, this is in the Acts of the Apostles, and the criteria were very simple. But he had to be with us from the time that John was baptizing, so basically Jesus' public ministry began, until the time he was taken from us, so that together with us he could be a witness to the resurrection. So it was all about the resurrection, uh, and it was never a special focus at all on the infancy or, or the birth of Jesus. So this is the great feast. So this feast of the resurrection, the death and resurrection of, of Christ, coincided with the Jewish feast of the Passover, which would coincide generally between the, around the month of Abib. So it, it's basically April or March, April, um, around that time. So about the 14th of, uh, of March or April, as the, the shifting of the calendars would have it. And you might recall from the time of Moses, you know, they had to get a lamb and they had to get it ready from the 10th day and then till the 14th day and male, a one year old without blemish and, and so forth. So the Christian feast, the original Christian feast is Easter. So it makes sense then to think, well, okay, what's the way we're gonna celebrate this feast? Well, all that was already pretty well developed uh, very soon after in the, in, in the celebration of Easter with the coming of Holy Spirit at Pentecost, because we have a lot of catechesis to the church, to the catechumens in Jerusalem, and a lot of the symbolism and so forth developed very early on with the church fathers. And if, if it's, you think it's better, I'm happy to close the door if it's uh, people are distracting. But anyway, otherwise we'll uh, we'll leave the door open. And uh, the so a lot of that meaning and symbolism of the resurrection of the Lord uh, was developed very early on. It then stands to reason that for to, in order to celebrate a great feast worthily, there needs to be a time of preparation. And hence the season of Lent 
was observed. Now the season of Lent only became official in the first council of first ecumenical council of the church, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, where there were about 318 bishops gathered together, and the, the big, uh, what do you call it, the big crisis that was facing the church at that time was known as the Arian heresy. And the Arian heresy basically said that Jesus was like a superman. He wasn't really, though, the son of God. And that has huge consequences. I mean, apart from being a heresy, it's not just some kind of a, uh, a technical uh, or a technicality, or Jesus happens to be divine and human. Hello, if he's just human and not divine, it means I can disagree with his opinions, just like I can disagree with the opinions of Aristotle, of Plato, or Heraclitus, or you know, someone more modern in the Middle Ages, Aquinas, Ambrose, uh, early on, or, or uh, anyone in our own century world leader because he would just be human but if he's divine all of a sudden now if I disagree with that opinion with his teachings I'm disagreeing with the God man so to celebrate this feast and Jesus worked miracles no other founder of any world religion whether you know in Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam has worked miracles but Jesus Christ did and his greatest miracles that were witnessed by all sorts of people, I, opening the eyes of the man born blind, raising the dead, but the greatest miracle was the revelation of the resurrection. And this was the, the, the greatest of them. And while many others saw believers and non-believers witnessed his miracles, only those who had believed in him, in fact, witnessed his resurrection. Now, to be sure, nobody actually witnessed the resurrection as such. And when we look at the Gospels, all the four different accounts, they give us different versions of the resurrection, but none of them actually tell us what happened. Oh, well, there was a, you know, yeah, they tell us about the angel coming from heaven, moving the stone away, but they tell us nothing about Jesus coming out of the tomb, okay? That, what we do see is a whole lot of accounts of the empty tomb and then Jesus living appearing to various people to his followers to those who had believed in him so to prepare for this feast from year in year out required a time of preparation and so very early on the church really began to live the season of Lent and then over the centuries it took on various forms so the word Lent in fact, comes from a very old English word uh, before 1000 uh, AD, known as, in fact, Lenten, because, uh, or spring, uh, it has to do with the lengthening of the days. So it's a very simple meaning of the word. Now you might say, lengthening of the days? Hang on, our days are getting shorter. Yeah, because we happen to be in the Southern Hemisphere. But Christ rose in the Northern Hemisphere, and yes, I know he's prejudiced against the South, but that's fine. We'll have to live with that. But so the symbolism of the day getting longer and then Christ rising uh, as the days are getting longer. Jesus is the light of the world, uh, the, the day of, of the sunlight and the daylight, the true daylight is Jesus. All that symbolism matched the seasons as they were in the Northern Hemisphere. So we do have to invert them. but. Okay, you know, so be it. It's still no less, the resurrection is still no less meaningful to us if we can discard the impact on the, on the seasons. So the season of Lent then had this foundation there. But you might say, well, what's the length of the season? How was this decided? Uh, I mean, and the number 40 was the number that has been decided on from pretty early days because the number of Jesus' days in the wilderness, preparing for his public ministry, which remember, is actually only a very short period of his life, three years out of 33. But preparing for that, he spent 40 days in the wilderness and uh, fasting. Uh, so as what we know from the scriptures is he didn't eat anything. Now, it's pretty hard to imagine that he didn't drink anything either. But who knows, if he were in a, or if he was in a mystical state, then as for example, Moses, when he's going up 
Mount Sinai, or uh, Elijah walking to Horeb, the mountain of God, walking for 40 days and 40 nights in the strength of this food and reaching. Then if, he were, if Jesus was in a mystical state, then it's possible that he didn't drink either. But certainly it's possible for a human being to not eat for 40 days and still live, but not to be without water. But that symbolism of the 40, you might say, was this something that Jesus himself just invented on a particular occasion? And the answer is no. It goes back to all the Old Testament messages that I've or uh, citations that I've just mentioned. So for instance, Moses was on the mountain. How many times? Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments? Twice, exactly, because the first time the Israelites were a bit hard-headed, and so he comes down and they rebel very quickly. He smashes the stone tablets. They, they milk a golden calf, you know. Human beings always want to control God. We want a God that we can put on the shelf uh, when we don't want him and take him off the shelf and adore him when it's convenient for us. And whether we like to admit it or not, the moment God is not the center of our lives, we're actually doing the golden calf thing, uh, even though it may not be so explicit as that. So anyway, so twice Moses was there in the uh, 40 days, 40 nights. The uh, Mount uh, Elijah, the prophet, one of the greatest prophets, uh, again, did that for 40 days and 40 nights, walked to Horeb, the mountain of God. The 40 also appears where the Israelites, the 12 spies, go into the land of Canaan and do a spying mission to work out what sort of land is this. Is it a good land? Is it a fertile land? Is it a wooded land? Is it a land of you know, wilderness? What is it? And they go and they come back, and 10 out of the 12 give a bad report. You might recall, only two good guys call them good guys because they talked favorably about the land of Canaan as truly flowing with milk and honey and rich in fruit and, and so forth. Fruits of all sorts of things, the fruit of the land. And that's Caleb and Joshua. And from there on in, this is in the book of Exodus, God says, okay, because you have basically scoffed at the land that I have given to you, you were 40 days and 40 nights in the land of Canaan, reconnoitering it, so now you will spend 40 years in the wilderness. And all that generation that were over 20 years of age died in the wilderness. So the 40 comes down to this. The 40 had a, a significance, a meaning of fullness, of uh, a fullness of time, the length of a generation to basically pass. So when we go to the season of Lent, the 40 is actually very significant. And whether you, how you count the days, and I'm gonna count them for you according to the revised rite of the Latin rite, but the Eastern Catholic rites actually begin the season of Lent, not on Ash Wednesday as we do in the Latin rite, but they begin on Ash Monday. It doesn't make as much sense to us, does it, Ash Monday? But that's because we're from the West. But, uh, so they begin their 40 days that way. And they don't count, the Sundays are not counted as part of Lent, generally speaking. So, uh, you know, technically you don't have to do your penance on the, uh, on the Sundays in Lent. Yep, question. I think uh, the Lent is around 30 days. Sorry? The Lent is 30 days. Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, the, the season of Easter, is 50 days, so there's 90 days total, but the 40-day preparation is pretty standard. Now, depending on how you count it, you might get extra days, just as I'm about to do it for you with the Latin rite. So we begin on on the Ash Wednesday, and uh, I'll talk about the symbolism of the ashes and all that in just a moment. But the so we begin on Ash Wednesday, so. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So the Sundays are not in there. There are six weeks in the season of Lent, roughly. Well, not roughly, six weeks in the season of Lent. And so take six sevens are 42. Take out the Sundays. Leaves you, what, 36? 
for down to 36 days, and then we come to Holy Week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of Holy Week that gives you the four days that, uh, sorry, 36, have I got that right? Um, the Sunday of Lent, the fifth Sunday, sixth Sunday, uh, sorry, five, five full weeks, so five sevens of 35, that's, yeah, 35, take out the, um, take out the five Sundays, 30, and now I'm getting confused here, <laughs> but um, hang on, oh yeah, that's right, 30, add the uh, Wednesday of Thursday, Friday, Saturday of the first week, so that makes it 34, and then add the Holy Week days, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday gives you six more days, and that gives you the 40 days. Now, a little problem here. Liturgically, we're told that the season of Lent ends officially on, uh, on Wednesday, right? With Holy Thursday, with the beginning of the Easter Triduum. But you know how it is in the church's calendar. We often go on two types of understanding of day. We go day in terms of sharing um, a part or, um, or uh, all thereof, the, a whole or part thereof, basically. So although Lent goes for part of Holy Thursday, the Easter Triduum doesn't start technically until the Easter, until Holy Thursday night. So we tend to count that whole day. But then also in the church, there's another understanding of day, namely that we the whole 24-hour period. We use, for instance, we say Jesus spent three days in the tomb. Did he actually, excuse me, did he actually spend three days in the tomb? If he's buried, Good Friday afternoon, late afternoon, and he rises early Sunday morning, just as the sun was rising. So again, that's a huge symbolism there. But anyway, we'll get to that um, in the three talks on, on, um, on the Easter Triduum. But that basically means all, all day Saturday, so Sunday, Friday afternoon, so till Sunday later, uh, till Saturday late afternoon, is there scarcely thirty six hours, forty hours in the tomb, but it's over three days, and in the Jewish mind, over three days, that is as good as three days. Okay, so we've got to be careful that we get don't get too caught up in the actual, um, you know, like physically work measuring out. Oh, this is how many hours, days to the second, because we're going to miss the symbolism. So Lent, that's how we work it out in the in the uh, the Western the, the West. In terms of the Eastern Catholic rites, so for instance, the Maronites, like the others, would all begin on Ash Monday. They stop then for the forty days, were short with the with the beginning of Holy Week. So they don't count Holy Week as part of the of the 40 days so that might be why you're um, saying they have 50 days um, of the season yeah, of yeah, Lent. I was actually uh, I have friends that were Eastern Orthodox uh, yeah. and from Egypt and they celebrate I think Easter one week or two weeks after every week. No the reason for that is actually because of the calendar change and I'll get to that yeah so uh, but yeah I mean I'll, I'll, I'm, I suppose I can address that now because we, we're on to the question the, but the, the different configurations of the, the 40, whether we're Eastern Catholic or Western Catholic, the mentality is still the same about the 40. So the idea is a time of intense preparation. Now the preparation is in terms of, oh sorry, before I go to the preparation, the Feast of Easter, I said, was the original Christian feast. And in fact, from the Feast of Easter, of all the movable feasts, that we have in the liturgical calendar. As we know, there are movable feasts, they change each year, and then there are fixed feasts. So Christmas is always on the 25th of December, for example. The birthday of Our Lady is always the 8th of September. The feast of St. Peter and Paul, 29th of June. But Easter is a movable feast. Now, interestingly, the way the church has worked that out is as a combination of both the lunar calendar and the solar calendar. Okay, how? The Feast of Easter every year always falls 
on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the, what do they call it, the invernal equinox, or whatever the equinox is at that moment. So you go to March, so March 21st, 22nd is the equinox, and then you go after that, you say, okay, when's the next full moon? So that's the sun calendar, first of all, the earth and the sun. And now we look at the moon and the and the, the sun calendar. Okay, where's the next full moon after that? And then where's the next Sunday after that? That's Easter Sunday. And that's infallibly how you calculate Sunday, Easter Sunday, every single year. So it's always based on those two calendars. Now it's interesting that the, the, the spiritual feast is, rests on the movements of nature because nature is God's creation. Nature reflects God's splendor and beauty. As uh, my favorite theologian uh, says that uh, von Balthasar, he says that uh, in volume one of his theological aesthetics, he says that the entirety of creation as a whole is a monstrance of God's real presence. And it's just a poetic way of saying that the real presence isn't just in the Blessed Sacrament in the Eucharist, but rather everything that we see around us is somehow a spark of God's glory. It tells us there is something outside of me that is not just fantasy, that it's real. And when we look at the fantastic, extraordinary nature of the created world, it is truly amazing. So the Feast of Easter works this way, and then, of course, uh, Ash Wednesday is worked out, whatever, 40 days before, Pentecost is worked out after that, and, and even go further enough ahead, you get the Feast of the Epiphany of that year, and, and, and so forth, right? But it all comes from Easter, and it makes sense. That's the pinnacle of the Christian feast. What does the church then do to help us enter into the season of Lent? And the season of Lent is a time of grace. If it's a time of preparation, then it's a time of responding more fully to the invitation of God's grace, to a conversion of heart. And a conversion of heart always means a metanoia, as the Greek says, that we're, we're confronting ourselves. What did Jesus have to encounter in his 40 days in the wilderness? Well, he was testing. And interestingly, the word in Greek for testing means both testing to, uh, to tempt and to attempt, peirazo. And I like to keep the same word in English, temptation, but you know, sometimes people say to me when we say the Our Father, oh, Father, why do, why do we have that word? Do not lead, me, lead us not into temptation. I don't want to be tempted. You know, temptation is about falling into sin. And it is true. That's one meaning of the English word temptation. But there's another meaning, means to be tested. And when we look at temptation, both God and Satan want to tempt us, want to sift us. I know what some of you are thinking. God doesn't tempt, you know. St. James says that God tempts nobody. You're right. He doesn't tempt anybody in that way. But he does tempt in the other way that I'm about to tell you, in the sense of sifting, testing. God tests us all the time. Because without testing, then our love is not proven. I was talking with one of the uh, uh, people in the Bible Union uh, uh, group on the campus last year, and we're having a good discussion uh, in the office there for about a, an hour or so on the, the whole scene in the Garden of Eden. You know, and what's that all about? And he was saying that, well, you know, it's not really about testing. It's about trust. It's about trust, he kept saying. I was like, well, it's, yeah, it's true. It's about trust. But is it just about trust? I said, take it further. Let's flesh out the idea. If it's just about trust, do you trust me? Will you trust me? Uh, in other words, God's saying to Adam and Eve, will you trust me? And they trusted him for a time or up to a point, but, but obviously they didn't trust him fully. See, trust, if it's just about trust that's never tested, then I do not know what is really there. It's like love that's never tested. Can I really know that 
I love someone or that someone loves me. Not that we go out of our way to deliberately test somebody's love, right? Or to test uh, our relationships. The normal movements of life will ensure that that happens. The ups and downs will test us, whether we like it or not. But testing is an essential feature of any relationship. And God was testing them, Adam and Eve, as he also tests now. If there was no competition to test our love for God, so God removes all obstacles, then our love for God, well, how can we be sure that it's really pure and genuine? Because there's no competition for him. He's got our affection. It's unbounded. It's often what you see sometimes in a very different way in a family. The first child is there. And, you know, the first child is five or six years old. And then another baby comes along. And they're not used to having to share the love of mum and dad with anybody else. But now all of a sudden there's this baby. And every time they cry, well, they get the attention. Mum goes jumping and... And even Dad forgets me a little bit. I don't like that. You see the dynamic. So what's going on here? All of a sudden, my baby brother or sister is testing my own attention for my or, or my access to my parents' attention. Now, hang on a minute. Uh, am I going to be resentful towards Mum and Dad because they're going to do that? Or am I going to learn to share? So too, the temptation, time of Lent, is a time of testing and temptation. But God and the devil both want to tempt us, but for different motives. The devil wants to tempt us in order to cause us to fall, to break us, to discourage us and break our spirits. God, on the other hand, wants to tempt us in order to prove our virtue, to inspire us, to love him more, to be more heroic, more generous, more virtuous in the end. And in order to help us do this in the season of Lent, again, from very early days, there were three ways in which the church marked out for her children to enter into the season fruitfully and faithfully. Who can tell me what they are? Three of them. Well, prayer, fasting, fasting. And almsgiving, yep, almsgiving or works of mercy. So, you know, we've got all those works of mercy, you know, the seven spiritual works of mercy and the seven corporal works of mercy. And again, when we look at those works of mercy, I uh, do a little test and see if we can come up with the 14 of them, but maybe we'll leave that test for another day, you know. And, uh, I mean, they're listed there in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, but, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of things there, good things, works of mercy, spiritual praying for the dead, correcting those in doubt, encouraging or those in doubt, correcting those in ignorance, and praying for the living and the dead, you know, burying the dead, giving physical arms, giving. A lot of those things don't get done. And there's a, a deep and profound connection between prayer and fasting and works of mercy. Why is it that the church hones in on these three and not on something else? Why doesn't she say, you know, just one or the other, or maybe just two of them? Why does she hone in on these three? Because each one of them, in fact, becomes like a cardinal virtue. We call them cardinal virtues, by the way, because they are like an umbrella that drags with it, behind it, a whole lot of other virtues. So too, when we pray, what's prayer all about? Okay, we've got the different types of prayer, vocal prayer, we've got mental prayer, we've got liturgical prayer. All of these things are great, but ultimately, it's about our personal connection with God, isn't it? I mean, it's about our personal connection with God. And as I turn to God, and God is the one who moves us to want to pray in the first place. So if you ever have any desire to pray, don't think it's coming from you, by the way. Just, uh, it's God who is moving you. In other words, God is drawing you. Okay, gives you a bit more bait. He's fishing, the ultimate fisherman. So when you're responding and you might actually feel a bit fervent and think, you know what, yeah, I'm feeling a bit holier than I did uh, three weeks ago. 
God is doing something in you, okay? Uh, don't put tickets on yourself because you'll fall very quickly. And, and the thing is, by the way, when God sees us getting a bit cocky or self-sufficient, God doesn't throw a banana peel in our path. We go looking for a banana peel and slip on it ourselves, you know? And he'll let us fall just until we're in the mess again, and then he picks us up, okay? Because God never wants us to rob him of his glory. He says, I will not yield my glory to another. So, in prayer, we're connecting with God, and we're surrendering to God. We're talking about all the things of our lives, our problems, our joys, our sorrows, our worries, our anxieties, our hopes, our dreams, all those things. And the touchstone of prayer is, how genuine is it? How genuine is my prayer? Now, question for you. How do I know, if ultimately I mean, if I am truly praying, genuinely praying? How can I know this? with some confidence? That's a question, so now you can answer. <laughs> Have a guess, if you're not sure. The camera's on me, so just your voice is gonna be recorded. Yes? It's dialogue, not monologue. Okay, so there's a dialogue, there's a listening and a, and a responding, for sure. But so after, you know, three years, four years, five years, 10 years, I'm praying. I'm praying each day. What should I notice after some years, at least? What in my life? My life should be changing. It's the ultimately. So there's absolutely a dialogue. And, and if there is a change in my life, then it's a sign that there has been a dialogue. Because God has obviously been inspiring me, and I have been responding to that. And sometimes I'll disagree with this. I don't know about you, but I'll disagree with God all the time. You know? And I'll, I'll actually correct him. I give him my explanations of uh, how I think he should be looking at the world and so forth. And he's, uh, no, I don't think so, Mark. You know, but he, he's so gentle, he doesn't say that straight out. He doesn't want to crush me. So he just tells me, Okay, you've had your say now, just keep listening to me, and my way's better. Uh, believe me, I've been around for a long time, he says. But, uh, okay, fine, all right, give up, I'm not going to wrestle with you anymore, and then I'll change my mind and go back to my old ways. But the thing is, life has to begin to change. If my life isn't changing, then I am not really praying. So that's why the church says that to us, because in prayer, that vertical dimension, us between, uh, between us and God, fasting, Fasting, there's many different ways of fasting, okay? I can fast and avoid all food and drink for the whole day, sunrise to sunset. But, you know, it, my energies are down, I can't concentrate, do my work. Is that kind of fasting actually going to help me? If I can't really focus on my work and do my duty? No, fasting is meant to be a help to my work. Fasting is always meant to be symbolic of the mastery of our bodies. I'm going to say something to you, and please try and remember it because it's actually profoundly true. And I heard this said in a talk years ago. The body is a great servant, but a terrible master. The body is a great servant, but a terrible master. In other words, the body is the vehicle of the Holy Spirit. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. But... The body also has impulses and desires, which are good in themselves. Desire for eating and sleeping and exercise and relaxing and joys. All sorts of joys of pleasure, our sexuality, a powerful instrument. All of these are beautiful things that help us to love one another, help us to love God, help us to love ourselves properly. But if we do not control, if we just give in to all of our desires all of the time, then the body will become our master. And it's a terrible master, but a great servant. So when we look after our body, that's great. And we discipline it, we make feed it well, we clothe it, we exercise it, we, we try eat good food and all of that sort of thing. We rest it properly. But the moment we begin to pamper the body, the body will become a tyrant. And now we'll want to dominate us. And there are many people, we don't have to look far and wide to see, there are many people who are enslaved in some kind of a bodily appetite. And I'm not just talking things in terms of sexuality, because our culture is so screwed up in this thinking. But even just things of food. There's so many, for instance, food disorders, 
that seemed to not have existed some time, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, what's going on? Well, I don't know exactly, but it's certainly one of the signs of the times. Or alcoholism, gone ballistic. Now, it existed for many years, right? There have always been drunkards and all that sort of thing. And there's different cultures, have less so and others more so. But again, another possible thing. Gambling, another thing. No? I mean, gambling is not so much a, a physical addiction, but it is another kind of addiction. So fasting is like a generic term, not only for fasting from food and drink, and we do this in the Latin rite, you know, we fast from food and drink, except water and medicine uh, for, well, th that's just for communion, but in, from meat and, and fasting on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And only if we're past the age of 18, and haven't yet begun our 60th year. So we've concluded our 59th birthday. But even that, that is for those who are actually able to fast. Those who couldn't fast, shouldn't fast. For instance, when I was, did my, some um, spinal surgery years ago, uh, well, how many years ago now? Nearly about seven years ago. I remember that time, Good Friday, I ate as normal because I had a wound. And, and, I, and actually had to, was on medication and all that sort of thing, had to feed the body. In other words, fasting would have been the wrong thing to do because the body needed work. Those who are in hospitals, those who are sick, need to eat so they can recover. The fasting is meant to be then about, about self-mastery. So it's prayer, fasting, and getting to the works of mercy. So the self-mastery. That self-mastery, though, can be done, and I would present to you, it's more difficult to do than doing straight-out fasting. Uh, because you could do straight-out fasting, you know, um, not eat meat or just eat half a meal, you know, three times a day or whatever. But the motive behind my fasting has everything to do with whether or not my action is virtuous. What do I mean? If I fast in order to say to myself, I can do this, is my intention upright? Or is it about proving a point to myself? Well, it's obviously about proving a point to myself. Now, you might say, well, hang on, I'm a bit afraid of fasting, so maybe I should just you know, I want to prove something to myself that I can actually do it. That's not what I mean. Not the person who is afraid of fasting. I'm talking about the person who will go a bull in a china shop and do the fasting. How are we doing? Oh, wow. Okay, gosh. Um, this always happens. Uh, I'm going to have to speed up. But anyway, so suffice to say, I can fast from upright motives or I can fast from the wrong motives. And, uh, and so the fasting... Um, if I'm doing fasting in order to, because I've got to prove something to myself, and then I can talk about it with my friends here, I can fast, that, that person should not be fasting. What I would suggest to that person is, do many, many little mortifications every day, sacrifices. Deny yourself some sugar in your tea or coffee, or don't have milk if you normally have it. Um, don't deny yourself a dessert. That's just with food. Uh, yes, you need to have a drink. Do you have to have your favorite drink? Drink something plain. Um, do you, okay, I'm going to have a drink now. I'm going to wait five minutes. I'll just wait for half a minute. Just that saying no to yourself, saying no to ourselves many, many different times in the day is phenomenal penance, really, because it means denying yourself. Every time your impulse wants to get the better of you, mm, no. Even, you know, we're sitting down, okay? Do I need to rest my back completely on the, on the chair or straight away? No, just... just, just Sit forward a little bit, just, nobody will ever know, nobody, but God knows and you know. And then, uh, so I just want you to be creative in the kinds of penances that you can do. And, and the more that's hidden in secret, your Father who sees all that is done in secret will reward you. Then the third thing, works of mercy. Works of mercy are so important because it teaches you to think of the other. The other and how you can reach out to them. And this, again, as, as I said, there's the seven spiritual works of mercy, the seven corporal works of mercy. You can find them on the, um, on the, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church or online. 
right? They're beautiful things to practice. But the three work together, prayer, fasting, and works of mercy. The prayer is designed to connect us deeply with God. What ensures that that relationship is genuine is whenever then we are sincere about sacrifice. Because love is proven when it is tested through sacrifice. So we grow then in self-mastery. And then as a further step is that love, that we're being purified, the final step of purification means that we, like God, are constantly thinking of the other. And you look at God, God is not thinking of himself in a, some kind of a selfish way. The Father is constantly thinking of the Son. The Son is thinking of the Father. The Holy Spirit is thinking of the Father and the Son and loving them. That's the within the Trinity. But then outside of the Trinity, God is constantly thinking of us, loving us. How can he help us and so forth? Now, God obviously doesn't think. I'm using it metaphorically. We think God just knows. So prayer works, fasting and works of mercy are the three things that the church presents to us in Lent so that we can grow in holiness. Then liturgically, there are a number of different things that the church does. For instance, she changes the color of the vestments. Now we'll wear violet instead of the normal green to show us that we're in the season of waiting. The Gloria is removed. Now it's still there in feast days and solemnities, but, but it's removed from the ordinary Sundays in Lent. And notice there's Sundays in Lent, not Sundays of Lent, because they're not part of the Lenten season. Now obviously they're part of the Lenten season in terms of the, the time frame, but they're not part of the 40 days. And they're not meant to be part of the penance. Now, does that mean you can't do some penance on the Sunday? Yes, you can, obviously. But the church in her canon law says on solemnities, and Sundays are solemnities, we are not obliged to do penance. So do some other little sacrifice that, in fact, helps you to um, forget yourself, to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and to love, love God and your neighbor more fully. The other thing that the church takes out in Lent is the Alleluia. We're not rejoicing. Now, is that because it's a time of sadness and mourning? No. But the church does this therapeutically, so that when we say the Alleluia the first time on Easter Saturday night, the Easter Vigil, wow, we haven't heard it for 40 days. In fact, by that stage, even longer than 40 days. So then when we hear it sung, it's joyful, it's exuberation, it's the, it's the thanksgiving and sharing in the glory of the risen Lord. So, uh, and then in the readings, she, the church chooses her readings very carefully in the season of Lent, in the liturgy. And in fact, she coordinates uh, the readings going on at Mass with the readings going on in the liturgy of the hours. She, so there's, there's a reflection there. Why? To help us maintain a greater unity of life in our prayer life. Then the first Sunday in Lent, the church always gives us the gospel, depending on which year we're in, A, B, or C, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, the gospel of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Boom. To show us about the humanity of Christ, that he was tested and sifted like one of us, but did not sin. On the other hand, the second Sunday of uh, Lent, the church always gives us the gospel of the transfiguration to show us the divinity, the hidden glory that Jesus had underneath his humanity. And this glory only came through after his resurrection. And then the other Sundays in Lent, she gives us gospels of the, the mercy of God, examples and uh, stories in the gospel where God's mercy is made known to us. Until eventually, uh, over the last now few days, there's a, in, a, an intensification of the, the debate and the opposition between Jesus and the leaders of the, of the Jewish people, and until eventually it leads to the flashpoint, well, the, uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, so uh, Sunday week, and then the flashpoint, of course, of the, uh, of the sacred triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter Sunday. How are we going for time? Do we have any moment for question? Five minutes. Okay, well, I think people lining up. Okay, so maybe we have a bit of time. Let me just check. A bit of time for, uh, uh, for some questions. Yeah. Any questions there? Go ahead. Uh, I heard that on Sunday we cannot help him, so it's like, yeah, it depends 
Penn on Sunday. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, no, you you can you can. I mean, penance. Oh, sorry, the penance associated with the sacrament of penance. That's different. It's meant to make up for your sins. The penance generally in the season of Lent is meant to uh, generically or in general make up for our sins. Now, granted. The penance associated with the sacrament of penance and the penance of fasting or denying yourself some food or just even not feasting your eyes on some beautiful scene. You know what? I'm, I'm tempted to look at this beautiful sunset. I'm, you know what? I'm going to deny myself for 10 seconds. It just there's an action there. And it's also that you develop a habit of, oh, I can't enjoy anything in life. No, enjoy God's beauty and splendor. But it's meant to be the penance without. Um, Keep in mind what is for becomes a negative thing and eventually just becomes uh, something sad. But penance that is meant to detach you from disordered desires and attach you to Christ, that is the real thinking behind that. And that should go on constantly. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Yeah. I would say, is the sort of the denial, I guess, also for the sake of like showing the value of what you're about to have? Or? Yes. Now, there's a difference here. Denying ourselves something that's wrong or sinful is one thing. Denying ourselves something that's good is, is what the normal mortification is. The reason we deny ourselves something that's good and wholesome in itself is to strengthen our willpower, to exercise that self-mastery over the impulses of the flesh, but not only just impulses of the flesh, just even desires of the soul by saying, strengthening our will to say no to things that are good and wholesome in themselves, we grow in our ability to say no then to things that are bad and disordered and would lead us away from God. So the idea is always about training. You hear people say, oh, I'll try, I'll try. You know what, it's not enough to try. We need to train, we need to train. And Lent is a season of training and ultimately training for the resurrection to celebrate it worthily, yes. Uh, doing all these things in Lent, Brian. So why not continue doing those things Absolutely. outside of Lent? Absolutely. Why not? So that's the question. Why, why not continue outside of Lent? And you can. That's why in Lent we give up certain things. We do certain things. But it's really by putting the accent on those things. It's to change our lives in a little bit, to help us take stock. But ultimately, we should learn from what the results, the, the fruitfulness of what's happened in Lent and then take that with us to the rest of our lives. So if we make a discovery into our hearts, our lives, something about history, our relationships, in Lent, that we now see, oh, you know what? That is a good thing. I should retain that for, make that part of my daily life. Stick with it, absolutely. I mean, if you find, you know, you put in a half an hour of prayer extra each day, and that's helped you a lot in Lent, well, you know what? Maybe you should try and keep that with you. Eventually, though, Lent isn't about doing more. It's always, yes, more in the love of God, love of neighbor, self-mastery, but it's about doing better. Better. What do we want to be? We want to be better people. We want to be less selfish. We want to be more loving, more self-sacrificing, more virtuous, more kind, more compassionate, more understanding, less judgmental, all those things. And, and that doesn't mean yeah, spending a whole lot of time doing a whole lot of other things. It just means understanding and knowing ourselves better to see what our switch points are and then applying the proper ointment for them. Yeah. Any other questions about today's talk? Great. Well, let's finish with a glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As, As it was, was in the beginning, is now, now and it shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the